So, distinguished guests, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and possibly even a good night for some of you by the end of this webinar. It's important I uh, cover the basis, given the disparate locations of our audience. We have um, advocates and judges pretty much from all over the world, and we're delighted that you've been able to join us this morning, afternoon, or evening. Welcome to Judging and Advocacy in Virtual Court Hearings an international experience. My name is Oba Nsubwe. I am head of uh, Palm Court Chambers in London. We're a large common law set specializing, I specialize anyway, in Africa-related disputes and commercial litigation. So briefly, the context of uh, this uh, morning's webinar, uh, although there are those that continue um, to play it down, the simple truth is that the effects of COVID-19 have been seismic delivery of justice and the practice of law uh, have not been immune to its effects and we've seen significant disruption uh, worldwide in this vital area of uh, the economy. Uh, hence the accelerated advent of virtual hearings and that's the important topic we want to examine today but uh, we want to examine it um, from effectively from an international aspect and focusing on Oceania, obviously Australia, uh, Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Africa, um, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and um, of course uh, Europe as well, uh, where we have um, judges uh, in that um, continent. In giving evidence to the House of Lords Constitutional Committee in mid-May, the Lord Chief Justice for England and Wales, Lord Burnett, said there will be no going back to pre-pandemic days for the courts in their use of technology. When asked by Lord Panic whether there would be a permanent change in the ways that lawyers and judges work, he said he strongly suspected there would be. Uh, when the Lord um, Chief Justice says strongly suspect, he means definitely. Although the picture in the English jurisdiction remains a mixed one, the direction of travel is pretty clear, certainly uh, for a proportion of court hearings. Uh, we are keen in this webinar to examine the judge's perspective and that of the advocate. Uh, there's no question in our minds that the skills will have to change and we as lawyers will have to learn those skills pretty quickly. In order to uh, scrutinize this topic, I am delighted to welcome a stellar cast of panelists, of speakers, uh, very, very um, grateful to them for joining us, probably for some of them getting out of bed early on a Saturday morning, and for others delaying their bedtimes to share their insights and their experience with us. I won't go into their um, bios, their bios are available, they are very distinguished, all of them experienced advocates or judges. I will say something, one or two words, just before they speak. They will hopefully speak for about 10, 12 minutes because time is of the essence. Before I hand over to the first speaker, um, a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, I will be referring to panelists by their first names most of the time, but my advice to you is don't try this in court. So that you have some idea of when the curfew will be lifted, the total time of this session will be around an hour and a half. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available as soon as possible. Uh, during uh, the webinar, just to check that you're paying attention, we will be running a couple of polls and publishing the results just to check that you're awake. Uh, we have had over uh, 600 registered participants, um, uh, which I think is a testament to the uh, interest in this area. And we're very, very grateful to all of you uh, for registering for this. There should be time for a few questions at the end. Uh, we've, we've received a huge number of questions in advance. We won't be able to cover all of them, but we will be answering them one way or another individually, uh, either by email or trying to do that in this uh, seminar. There is some uh, best practice information which uh, you may be interested in, and uh, we will make that available to you as, as soon as possible after the webinar has finished. And by best practice, I'm referring to some case law already and um, some very, very useful guides, particularly for the advocates in uh, remote hearing advocacy. Please remember to turn your microphones and videos off 
uh, that should improve your bandwidth uh, and that will also uh, eliminate any kind of um, feedback that may be coming uh, to us. Delighted now then with the housekeeping matters over to welcome our first uh, speaker, um, Sir Bernard Eder. Uh, he is a, an international judge uh, at the International Commercial Court in Singapore. Apart from that, uh, as uh, many of you will know, he sat as a High Court judge in England and Wales for a number of years. And before that was an extremely distinguished silk at the commercial bar. Uh, he has over 300 arbitrations under his belt, which I simply don't know how he managed to get through all of those. So Bernard, uh, over to you. Good. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear. Thank you, Oba. Um, I'm actually sitting in London um, at my home because of COVID. But behind me, you will see the uh, Supreme Court um, in Singapore. Uh, and as Oba said, I, I am an international judge at the Singapore International Commercial Court. I'm also an arbitrator. But so far as the court is concerned, even before COVID, um, I think it led the way in terms of court virtual hearings. Uh, in 2019, even before uh, COVID, there were some 25 hearings in the International Court uh, in Singapore that were conducted uh, uh, by way of a virtual uh, uh, hearing. And given it is an international court, we often have hearings where three judges will be sitting at first instance. So I did a case with a judge in Singapore, uh, a judge in Australia, and I was the third judge, and we were participating uh, in this hearing, hearing witnesses, uh, hearing submissions over a number of days uh, uh, through a virtual uh, hearing. Uh, so as I say, um, uh, Singapore has, I think, led the way, uh, uh, and that will certainly, as Oba said, continue. It has continued uh, during COVID. So um, uh, I am just about to start uh, in two weeks time a 10 day uh, witness trial uh, in Singapore, uh, uh, sitting in London uh, using, I think it will be Zoom. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, equally, I should say in arbitration, uh, I know this uh, uh, webinar is not really about arbitration, but virtually all hearings since uh, the beginning of the year since uh, COVID took, uh, took effect have been conducted uh, by arbitration, uh, by video. Um, so I was doing a hearing two weeks ago where an English uh, barrister sitting in London was cross-examining a witness in China through an interpreter sitting in Singapore uh, and other participants flung around the world. There were something like 40 uh, and it worked perfectly well. Uh, and if you think about, uh, if we hadn't done that, it was supposed to take place in Singapore. If we'd all had to go to Singapore, uh, the additional time and expense would have been very much uh, greater. So that is the background. Um, uh, there are practical difficulties so far as virtual hearings are concerned. So for example, time zones uh, and different witnesses may be in different places and one has to bear that in mind. But there are a number of uh, matters that I would like to emphasize right at the beginning. Um, the first is legality. Um, a number of two main questions arise so far as the legality, uh, the international law position, uh, with regard to sittings uh, by way of a virtual hearing. The first is the position of the judge. So I am sitting in Singapore, in London, uh, sitting as a judge in the international court in Singapore, and the question arises as to whether that is constitutional, both as a matter of Singapore law and as a matter of English law. Um, I don't want to go into the details of that, but who, uh, that needs to be uh, considered rather carefully. The second question is the legality with regard to witnesses. Um, now, surprisingly, perhaps, um, I, I have been told only in the past few days that certain countries will not allow, not allow, I mean it is illegal according to the local law, for witnesses to give evidence uh, by video to a foreign court from within their state, the territory of their state. Uh, and I have been told that that is the case, uh, either is or may be the case anyway, and the position is uncertain, with regard to a number of European countries and a number of other countries uh, uh, around the world. So if you are thinking about a virtual hearing, you should satisfy yourselves that it is a legal uh, hearing. It may affect enforceability at the end of the day. The second main topic I wanted to raise was choice of platform. 
Now, some of you may know this, there are a number of uh, 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 individual uh, companies that offer platforms. So Zoom is the big one at the moment. There is Blue Jeans. Uh, there is something called Skype for Business. There is Microsoft Teams and there is Google. Um, they are all to a large extent similar. They have similar, some are better than others. Uh, be careful about security. So I was doing a hearing about four weeks ago. In the middle of the hearing, it was a blue jeans hearing, a lady uh, appeared on screen in the middle of a witness giving evidence and said, hello. Um, she had absolutely nothing to do with the case and had somehow managed to breach security and parachuted into the hearing. Uh, I didn't know who she was. I was chairing the hearing uh, and I managed to persuade her to um, go away in the nicest way possible. Uh, but be careful about security. Um, if you do a virtual hearing, my own very strong view is you should have a host, a professional host to conduct the, all the technical side. Uh, and here we're very grateful for Ova has organized this, uh, Simon Gore and uh, Sean Callum, I think, who've been helping on this. And I think that is absolutely essential. The third thing I wanted to mention is a protocol for the virtual hearing. Now, over the past few months, what has happened in London is that as cases develop, um, these protocols uh, have expanded. And the last hearing I did last week, uh, there was a protocol of 10 pages setting out in particular detail the, I'm not sure, rules that were to uh, be applied uh, to the virtual uh, hearing. And it extended, for example, to what the witness has to say. Uh, a, 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 uh, when you, uh, the witness first gives evidence, he has to confirm certain things. So for example, he's on his own in the room. Uh, he has no documents available because you will not be able to see that particular witness during the hearing. So those are matters uh, of very considerable uh, importance. Um, anyone wants a protocol for the hearing or a draft, uh, they can contact, I think, Ober or me uh, afterwards, uh, and I'm sure that somehow or other, we will be able to circulate to you a draft virtual uh, hearing protocol. Um, um, uh, every, it's, a, it's a bit of plagiarism. Everyone has been stealing everyone else's ideas of, of what to put in this uh, protocol, but it's important uh, that uh, it uh, should be uh, uh, agreed. So those are the really important things that um, uh, I, I wanted uh, uh, to emphasize. In terms of personal experience for me, I think it has been a huge success. Um, other uh, speakers who will be coming in a moment will give you uh, some tips on advocacy and practical ways of dealing with a hearing, which are really, really important. Um, for example, dress. Um, I did a hearing last week uh, where everyone started off, at least the men were all wearing a shirt and a tie and a jacket. It was very hot in London. Um, on the second day, ties seemed to have disappeared. On the third day, jackets uh, disappeared. Um, uh, and on the uh, fourth day, um, sleeves were rolled up. And I thought that the fifth day, it didn't happen, but I thought on the fifth day, people would arrive in um, t-shirts and, and, and swimming gear. In fact, that didn't happen. It rained uh, yesterday, so we were all right in the end. It was back to jackets. Uh, but rule, uh, I say rules as to the dress and, and how you proceed. Um, again, other people will talk about uh, uh, advocacy. Um, the two things I would say uh, are these. First of all, in order for a virtual hearing to be successful, it has to be well organized. Um, organization is everything both in terms of internet connectivity of people around the world and in terms of the order of witnesses uh, and how things uh, uh, work. Uh, that is really, really important. Uh, and again, other people will talk about it. The last thing I wanted to mention, and I'll pass on, on to others, and that is advocacy. Um, being an advocate in a virtual hearing is different from being an advocate in court. Um, other people will speak about this, but it is tremendously important and different people have different uh, ways of dealing with this. Referring to documents, for example, in the course of a hearing is very, very difficult. So, for example, um, I received yesterday for my 
case in the SICC in the International Commercial Court uh, in Singapore, which is starting in two weeks time, I hope you will see this UA USB. Uh, on that USB is a full electronic uh, hearing bundle. I say hearing bundle. There are something like 50,000 documents on this USB. Uh, they have all been page numbered uh, uh, and, and sorted. And as we will go through the hearing, the organizer of the uh, virtual hearing will be able to put up on screen um, um, uh, the documents on this U USB. Um, but organization uh, is absolutely uh, 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 everything. And that's why certainly in Singapore, it is unbelievably efficient. And if the hearing is not efficiently conducted, uh, uh, problems uh, will occur. In terms of advocacy, the one thing I have found, and I'll leave it for other speakers, and I'll end on this note, and that is my own experience, is that advocacy is much shorter. It is difficult to be a long, boring, inefficient advocate in a virtual hearing. So in a way, I, I think virtual hearings will make things cheaper. People won't have to fly around the world. It'll make things faster. Um, you can have hearings virtually within a very short notice. You can have a hearing just this evening. It'll, uh, it doesn't mean that people have to travel in order to come to a hearing. So I am very much a strong advocate in favor of virtual hearings, provided, of course, they are dealt with efficiently. And with that a word, I pass on to back to over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Bernard. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I can see on the chat um, a request. Can people turn off their videos? We can see Mungo Bovi QC. Very nice to see you, Mungo. But um, perhaps if you can turn off your video, um, we can um, see you, take you from the top line. Uh, Sir Bernard raised a number of interesting points that we will come back to. Uh, time for our first uh, poll. Um, perhaps we can uh, put that up on the screen. And what people can do is, as the poll comes up, uh, they can just answer and submit uh, the um, answer to the to the poll. What percentage of the audience have conducted a remote hearing using one of the video link platforms? We will get some feedback on the answers uh, at a later point. I'm just leaving that poll there for a few more seconds, hopefully to give you time to uh, submit an answer. We've had to set up a YouTube channel uh, to accommodate a number of other people. I'm not sure you can vote on YouTube. I'm sorry about that, but those others uh, should be able to, to vote. And good morning to Australia. So um, we can now, I think, take that uh, down or put that to one side and uh, move to our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Dato Lim Chiwi. Uh, Chiwi is a commercial advocate based in uh, Malaysia. He um, is uh, a very experienced arbitrator. Uh, he is also former president of the Malaysian Bar. So over to you, um, Chiwi. Thank you, Oba. Um, I would like to expand on what Sir Bernard Eder said about organization or organizing your materials. And the uh, tips I intend to give is on the steps of preparation that you have to take before the hearing. And the tip number one I'll say is this, plan your work and work your plan. Step one, drop your plan of steps leading to and during the online hearing. So what does that involve? Step two is equipment. And by equipment, we're, I'm referring to desktop, laptop with audio video features and Equally important question is how many monitors should you have? And the answer is, can be two, can be three, can be just one, depending on the advocate, is whatever the advocate is comfortable with. Uh, for myself, I have one for the online hearing, uh, I have one for internal communication with my legal team and client, and I have one for the documents. Then there's also the question of earphones. You have options of, of either earphones or, or, or headphones. I think most uh, judges, and speaking from, for myself as, a, as an arbitrator, we would prefer advocates to use uh, earphones instead. Um, then there is the uh, important uh, issue of ensuring stable and strong internet access. Step three is the environment. And that is 
whether or not you want to conduct a hearing as an advocate either at home or the, in the office. Either option works so long as it is quiet, there are no interruption, there's proper lighting, and you have all the relevant equipment uh, uh, in, the, uh, in either the, the house or office. Step four is know your judge's online hearing likes and dislikes. Your, the judge you're appearing before could be old school, where all he wants is to monitor purely for gallery view. Everything else the judge may say he prefers hard copy documents. Or the judge could be new school, where the judge may like to have share screen of submissions and documents. So that depends uh, on, on the judge. Also work out the protocol. Not everything will be in the uh, applicable protocol in your jurisdiction. Go through it and in your preparation, you will find that there'll be gaps in the protocol. For example, how do you interrupt your opponent? That is again something that you, you find out from either the court interpreter or your colleagues who appeared before the judge, what is the judge's uh, preferred uh, 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 manner of interruption? Do you raise your hand or you must never, of course, speak over the, the, uh, your, your opponent. Then also uh, discuss the protocol as to opportunity to stand down with video or audio on mute in order for you to uh, confer with your team or your client. And remember this, that in an online hearing is two-dimensional where all you see are just faces and human bodies uh, in, in, in a box, unlike an, a physical uh, a hearing where it's three-dimensional. So a lot of things you do not get to see as you ordinarily would. So you must plan for that. Step four, of course, um, is uh, just extension uh, of the uh, protocol uh, is what do you do when, for example, the, in the midst of hearing is disconnected? So again, you, 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 you have an agreed protocol with your opponent and then con uh, uh, consult the uh, judges, uh, 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 registrar or interpreter. The, the final and most important step is step five, dry runs. And you must have two dry runs, one internally, one with your opponent um, and also with the court uh, uh, reg registrar to make sure everything uh, works, uh, that there's no echo, the protocol that has been agreed upon works and if there's anything left out, uh, uh, come to an arrangement with the court registrar. The second uh, issue, the second matter uh, that's important for your preparation is what uh, uh, Suburban Eda spoke about, documents. And how do you then handle uh, uh, documents uh, in an online hearing? You have your e-bundles, you have your pagination, your, your format of document of, of uh, PDF, and then also you preload the documents. Now, do this from the outset. When clients instruct or engage you, in, insist on your client giving you, or provide you with a digitized copy of all the documents. It saves you, saves you time from having to uh, scan the documents yourself. And when it's digitized, make sure it's PDF searchable um, and also it's divided into folders and subfolders or volumes and tabs and page numbers. It can be things like uh, uh, agreements, can be minutes, can be correspondence, so on and so forth. And for pagination, make sure there's central pagination of the, all the bundle, top right corner. And, I'll, I'll, and, and the main reason for that is sometimes when you're scrolling, it's always good to have the pagination on the top right uh, corner of each page. Make sure your PDF is searchable. And again, have your e-bundles ready uh, for downloading uh, uh, with the, uh, for, the, for the courts in advance of your dry run uh, with the courts. I now come to how best to use documents uh, to ensure a seamless presentation. And this works um, well with the new school judges. But even with the old school judges, it can work if you minimize the uh, chair content of, of slides or documents. And here I, I, I request Simon to assist me by putting up my four pages slide and go straight to slide two, which is the sample one decision tree. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Simon, is it possible to bring down the poll? It, it, it still shows on my, on my page, on my screen. Thank you. So now, this is my tip as to how you can have a seamless presentation uh, where you need the judges to focus in on your arguments. And I find setting out a decision tree uh, is useful. The, the case that, that is in front of you, the decision tree, 
uh, is a oppression petition case where there were complaints about what's called the 2008 strategy and other complaints on the right column. So what I've done is to, to uh, divide up the complaints of the uh, claimant, the uh, allegedly oppressed uh, claimant uh, into the 2008 strategy and the rest on termination requirement, tendency dividends on the right. So, and for the critical documents, I have also set up a hyperlink to them. And you will find also that what I've done is to order the issues one by one so that as you're going through your submissions, you're following the order as it appears in the decision tree. And if your, your judge is, is either a hybrid of old, new school and, and new school, then what you could do is for seamless presentation, you can click on refer to 2008 strategy chart. That's a hyperlink. And it should then uh, uh, bring you to the actual document itself. So this is about five, five steps in order to reach uh, the hyperlink. And there you have it. And again, there's another uh, uh, decision tree in, in there, uh, uh, taking the, the, the judge through all the various issues and various findings he has to make on this matter. Um, can we go back uh, to the uh, decision tree, please? Yes. So Simon, if you can now go to the timeline. So what I had was the decision tree of issues and arguments and authorities. Timeline, and this is another case that I'm handling, is the facts. Presenting your facts in very simple snapshot manner for the judge to follow. And so this is a, 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 a dispute over the validity of a notice for a general meeting. So I have there, for example, the AEGM, which is the adjourned uh, extraordinary general meeting notice of 19 February, 2020. And I can go in there if uh, Simon can just open the link. And there you are, the notice appears. A question was asked whether there's a need for a separate monitor. You don't need a separate monitor. You can use the hearing monitor because the share content will pop up uh, uh, in the hearing monitor. So if you organize your materials um, in terms of number one, everything is digitized. Number two, you organize your arguments uh, in, uh, in terms of your facts and your law and the issues. You can then have a decision tree which guides the judge through all the various questions and issues he has to determine in order to reach a conclusion that you want the judge uh, uh, to, to arrive at. Uh, Simon, uh, we don't need this anymore. Thank you. Then I, I come to the importance of written submission and the attitude you should adopt uh, in so far as student submission is concerned, that is that you must tell yourself, I want to win the judge as he's reading my, read my, my written submission. So that when you go into the online hearing, you've really won the judge over. And your, your oral submission is just to reinforce uh, your arguments. And so far as written submissions go, it must be concise, clear. There should be a summary of arguments in the first two pages so that the judge knows within the first five minutes what your argument is. The balance of your sub written submissions should be expanding on your summary of arguments. You must use punchlines, headlines, timeline, flow charts, as, as, as I've shown. Finally, um, insofar as my personal practical tips, I always say this, choose your top five arguments, facts, documents, and authorities, and have it uh, 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 stated clearly in your written submissions and we emphasize it in your oral submissions. Thank you, Oba. Kiwi, thank you very much. Um, Chibi, I just want to check whether your slides are patented uh, because they, there's a demand, I think, <laughs> to share your slides. They've been, they've been um, very popular. Um, all right. Uh, I just uh, we'll, need to... We'll do that, we'll do that later. Yes, we'll do that later. Yeah, we'll but but Chibi, that's, those, are, those, are, those are practical points, fantastic. We will have time for discussion later, um, but thank you for your oh. presentation. So we will next move uh, to uh, Sir, Sir, Sir Jonathan Cohen. Um, Jonathan is a High Court judge in England and Wales. He is in the family division. Uh, before becoming a High Court judge, he was in silk for many, many years, uh, principally practicing in family law, although when he started life at the bar in England, he uh, was practicing in a number of different areas. Um, Mr. Justice Cohen, thank you for joining us. Over to you. In the last 12 weeks since lockdown started in England, I must have conducted somewhere between 80 and 100 hearings, 
all of them uh, remote. Uh, I haven't been into my courtroom in that time. Um, although a lot of the hearings I have conducted from my private room in the Royal Courts of Justice, but that's a matter of personal convenience. Uh, they've all been family cases, a mixture of international abduction, serious child abuse, and more than anything else, money cases, divorce settlements, some of them involving hundreds of millions of pounds. And they've lasted anything between five minutes and five days. I think we in the family court move quicker than other branches of the uh, English judicial system. And fairly quickly, we, we realized that this is going to be a long haul. And although it was initially felt to be attractive to put off certain cases um, until the crisis passed, we realized that there were two very good reasons why we should only take that step absolutely exceptionally. The first is, of course, if you put cases off, you just create a massive back backlog. Um, and this is something that the criminal lawyers in particular are finding has created a massive problem. Um, to get a five day case in front of me on a money case, you're probably gonna wait nine months anyway. If we don't do anything for um, three months, six months, nine months, however it's going to be, the delay will become intolerable. The second reason is quite a lot of what family courts do is child protection. If you're going to decide whether or not you're going to take children away from hard drinking, drug taking, uh, physically abusive parents, you can't just simply put that decision aside and say, well, we'll wait till we can have a proper court hearing. You've just got to get on and deal with the case. So after that introduction, um, how, does it, how can you make the hearings work best? Um, I agree with what other speakers have said. Do get someone else to uh, set it up in advance and to test it. It's not a good use of the judge's time, probably not a good use of the advocate's time if they've got someone who can do it for them. To spend your time setting up a link. Uh, secondly, if you have someone who cannot get onto a link, it is perfectly practical and workable if you have one or two people ringing in on the landline or on a mobile phone. Provided you've got your speakers work in, in the right position, that can work perfectly well. Of course, it's harder if they want to get your attention. And all you can do in those circumstances is make sure, as a judge or an advocate, that you involve everyone who is not visible during the hearing by checking with them whether they have any questions or any problems in participating. Interpreters, if you need them, must be on a separate line uh, with the person to whom they're interpreting. Otherwise, it becomes very disruptive if you have to stop a hearing to let the interpreter do the translation within uh, every few minutes. I am not a tech wizard. Um, I normally will print out in hard copy the absolutely core documents, but it is actually very easy, I found to my surprise, to navigate a, an electronic bundle, which I have on a separate screen. And I slightly feel if I can do it, then the vast majority of people must be able to do it too. Um, it may sound an odd thing to say, but do lock up your dogs and your children before the hearing begins. I've actually had more hearings disrupted by barking than I, uh, from dogs than I have from children wandering into view. Um, as an a, trip, uh, a, a tip to advocates, if you are naturally an advocate who waves your hands around, they become extraordinarily visible if you are doing a remote hearing, far more visible than they will appear in a courtroom. 
So be alert to that. Uh, I agree with something that Bernard said, be formal, be smart. This is a big deal for the litigants whose cases you are deciding. They're not likely to be impressed if uh, they can see in the camera judges or lawyers uh, wearing open neck shirts, coffee cups, uh, ashtrays, whatever it might be. Um, many people will not be worried about it, but there will be some who will, and you need to be sensitive to them. Big difference between public hearings and private hearings. Public hearings don't forget to make arrangements for the media to listen in if they are interested. Um, public hearings we, th that I do, I very often will have the press association uh, in attendance and other people can apply uh, for a link to, which they will automatically get. But if they are private hearings, at the very start, I will always repeat what people should know anyway, which is that it is illegal to record the hearing um, and that no one else should be present when evidence, when the case is taking place. Now, to reply to a question somebody else uh, said, uh, someone else asked, how can you be sure that there isn't someone else coaching? And the short answer is you can't be certain, but it's, you can very often pick up the body language. Um, but it is a, a risk and there's no getting away uh, from it. Regular short breaks, long hearings um, are tiring for everyone. Uh, you're probably not sitting in a particularly comfortable position. You're going from screen to screen. Um, don't feel shy of saying to everyone, right, we've been going for an hour and a half. We'll take a 10 minute break. Then. What are the downsides of remote hearings? Well, the biggest one, of course, which someone raised in a question is, how can you tell whether a witness is telling the truth? Most people would say that um, it is more easy to judge uh, credibility if you have the witness in front of you. And that has led to the development in England of hybrid hearings which I'll come on to in just a moment. Second downside, settlement meetings, which we have in all our financial cases, have a lower degree of success if done remotely. I, I and most of my colleagues would expect to settle perhaps three quarters of cases who come before us, uh, which come before us for a settlement meeting. Our experience is that remote hearings probably achieve only about half that degree of success. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't just defer the case, but you do seem to settle fewer cases. It may be that then some settle between the settlement meeting and trial, um, in which case, of course, as the judge, don't become aware of that. Downside, of course, is that not everyone is IT savvy or has the equipment. But uh, again, you, there are normally other ways of enabling people to participate. But let me return to the hybrid hearing and, and finish on that. To use a, a, an obvious example, let's say you have a dead baby um, and some living children from a couple and you've got to decide what the future of the living children will be. And so you need to know whether the uh, death of the baby was a natural event or was it caused by the mother shaking the child or the boyfriend shaking the child or uh, some third party. And most of us, most judges are very reluctant to do that remotely. And so we have developed hybrid hearings where all the professionals the doctors, the radiologists, the paediatricians, the social workers will give their evidence remotely and in the court will be the three alleged perpetrators 
with at least one lawyer with them. Uh, and the judge will be in the courtroom. Now, these things are much harder to set up than you might imagine. In my courtroom, which has, will probably seat 40 to 50 people if you crammed everyone in, if you've got to keep two meters away from everybody, it will take nine. So there is a, a very serious limitation on the number of people you can get in, and often a more serious problem with how you actually get them into the court. And we've now developed a system, you get them, everyone's given a number and you're called in by number so that you don't have people getting too close to one another in the um, doorways. But it seems to work. And most, most of us now are dealing with those sort of hearings where credibility is crucial by having these hybrid hearings. Um, and uh, that is certainly uh, a uh, system which I would recommend. Um, Barbara, I think that's everything. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, really, really good to hear what's happening in the family division. The um, president, I think, has issued uh, something called the road ahead, which we will make available to participants. Yes. It's a very detailed document dealing with how the family division is going to go forward in the foreseeable future. Um, and we will um, show that later. And, and I think, the, that, yes. Uh, can sorry. I just share, say there's one other document which came out only yesterday, which is the fifth version of, uh, uh, of how to conduct uh, I, um, remote hearings in the family division from Alistair MacDonald. And I'll get, I'll get that to you as well. Thank you very much. There's, there's been a, a, there's one of the questions, we'll deal with it later, whether we should be calling them remote hearings or virtual hearings. Uh, there's some um, pushback against virtual hearings, but we'll discuss that later. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, we can, I think, have now the results of the poll, which we put up. Um, so what percentage of the audience have conducted a remote hearing using one of the video link platforms? None, 39%. So, um, that is the majority, but there are there's a significant number who have uh, conducted remote hearings, which is, I think, excellent to see. Uh, but remembering, as we must, that our audience is very diverse. We have a number of advocates in the UK and indeed judges in the UK on this webinar. Welcome to them. And they will have done, I think, a number already. Uh, we have a number of advocates in Asia who I'm sure have done many of these. Many, many advocates in Africa. And indeed, we have a Supreme Court judge in Africa who's tuning in um, and has asked a difficult question. We'll come back to that. But that's an interesting close. That's an interesting um, poll. And um, we will, I think, show that at the end. Thank you. We can put that to one side. So uh, moving on from Jonathan, I'm now turning to Brendan Navin, who is uh, an advocate in Malaysia. He is the former chair of the Kuala Lumpur Bar and uh, an extremely an extremely experienced advocacy trainer, as I have discovered um, to my uh, peril. So um, Brendan will deal with um, the, uh, the preparation part of the advocate. Over to you, Brendan. Thank you. Thank you. Over. Could I start with two preliminary points first? Um, the first being that the objective of the court uh, in a remote hearing or an online hearing is to replicate as close as possible a physical courtroom setting. Uh, and as an advocate in any jurisdiction, you have to be vigilant uh, to ensure that the virtual hearing or remote hearing is nothing more than a different method of communication, uh, rather than something different in substance to the conventional adversarial system that we have. Uh, and as an advocate, you should be very vigilant to ensure that nothing changes in terms of how you conduct a hearing or a trial uh, in substance. Uh, the second preliminary point would be that judges have remarked across the world that one hour of an online hearing uh, is far more tiring than one hour in a physical courtroom. Uh, and bearing those two points in mind, uh, I would say as a starting point that what is good advocacy in a physical courtroom setting should in theory be the same for an online hearing. So for all the experienced practitioners in the audience, you are accustomed to owning and controlling a courtroom with your physical presence, how you look, how you stand, 
how you speak, what you say, all those tips and, and skills that you already have would serve you well in an online hearing. There are some differences though, and as Chiwi said earlier very correctly, uh, it, now it's just that one small screen, that one small window on that screen that you appear before the judge. Let me start with how you look and how you sound. Uh, and I've got five very quick points to make. The first being lighting. Never sit with a window or light behind you. Let me illustrate why. Uh, I'm coming before you and I've tried to have a, a very plain neutral background behind me. But if there was a window behind me, this would be how I look to a judge. Uh, and that's not as effective as this view that you have in front of you now. Same goes, the second point uh, is background. Um, it should be what I, I try and do here and what Anna is trying to do, a plain and neutral background. Uh, you'd be wearing court attire. Uh, so the lighter the color, the better in my view. Uh, you would make an effort to take down. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about the judges here because the judges are consumers of advocacy. I'm talking about the advocates and how they present themselves to a judge. Uh, try and take down any photographs or paintings uh, behind you. I've taken down the painting from behind my wall in the office. Uh, virtual backgrounds, uh, uh, I, I don't think they, they work as well as an advocate. Uh, Chiwi, if you could help me illustrate, could you, uh, Chiwi or Sir Bernard, could you lean back? Uh, and, and usually if your virtual background is not a great virtual background, you disappear into the virtual background. Uh, and I think most judges would prefer if they were going to spend time with you in a, in a, in a, court, in a virtual courtroom, they would prefer a clean, uh, plain background as opposed to bookshelves uh, and virtual backgrounds. Uh, again, that's just my view. Uh, positioning, position yourself not too close, not too far from the screen. Uh, this is really bad. Uh, and of course, this is not so great either. Um, what I've done is I've had my laptop on a pile of books to ensure that the face to screen height ratio is correct. Uh, if not, it would look something like this. Um, so try and get all this done, which leads me to the next point, which is ensure that all the audio and visuals are as perfect as they can be. Um, you would try to use enhanced equipment if you have. Uh, one of the greatest practical tips I received while doing this is uh, earpiece. Um, and I use one side of the earpiece in one year rather than both ears because I don't like the fact that I can't gauge how I sound if I have both uh, earpieces in, my, in both my ears. Um, the earpiece serves uh, a brilliant uh, solution to uh, Justice Cohen's point earlier about dogs barking and in Malaysia cats meowing uh, because the earphone plugged into your laptop eliminates quite a bit of the, of the sound surrounding uh, you when you are speaking. Obviously, when you're not speaking, what you should be doing is uh, putting yourself on the mute function because the last thing you want to do is distract the judge or the advocate who is submitting at that time. Um, I, also, uh, I also noticed that when I have the earphones in, I sound more crisp and I hear the judge or the other side better as well. Um, the fifth point, as Chiwi said earlier, the test run is absolutely crucial. Uh, I, I would put it this way, the test run is crucial to iron out any imperfection that you may have. Again, I speak from the point of view of an advocate. Uh, I, I look at it from the point of view of how I should appear to a judge. Uh, and that's an important part of advocacy, how you appear to a judge. Um, the test run I would do to, is to iron out imperfections. Uh, and Justice Cohen has made this point. Uh, when I did my test run, uh, I was judged by my, my colleagues as having my hands waving around quite a bit. That's quite natural in a normal courtroom, in chambers or in open court, for me to express my views uh, by using my hands. But you can tell now from what Justice Cohen said and what I'm doing now, that on this small screen, it's hopelessly distracting to have my hands make that point. Uh, the other thing I found myself doing is I'm trying to move forward and backward when I try and emphasize a point. That works quite well in, in the courtroom. It's natural. It's not something that distracts a judge in a larger scale setting. But this looks really bad uh, as I do it uh, in an online setting. The voice modulation and the, the, what you see in the screen, it doesn't work. Uh, so I've ironed out those two things quite quickly from my uh, visuals. All, all this, I mean, you may not agree with all the points I've just made. Uh, all this I do to enhance the visuals for the judge, as I said. 
judges will already have to strain to listen to you, to watch you, to understand the arguments that you made in a remote hearing. Uh, I would do everything possible to make it easier on, on them during that one hour or less in the time I have. In fact, I would make every effort to make it a more pleasant experience for them. Um, jumping straight to what are some of the effective tips for advocacy. Uh, this would apply both to physical and, and remote hearings. The five points I feel are important, and, and Sir Bernard has mentioned one of them already, be dramatically concise, uh, get straight to the point. There is no time to develop your argument in the normal way that a judge may give you in a physical courtroom. Um, hearings will undoubtedly be shorter. All the hearings I've done have been much shorter. Uh, there'll be no time to, take, to go through in a, a roundabout sort of fashion and finally coming to the point that you want to make in devastating fashion. Second point, be clear in the tone and speaking voice. Uh, you need to audit that out when you're doing your test run. How you sound, how fast you speak. I'm sorry, I'm speaking very quickly because I'm watching the time that we have. Um, use a very measured pace when you submit. No one expects you to speak as fast as I'm speaking now in, during a hearing. Uh, they expect you to be, judges expect you to be concise, but they expect you to speak to them in a very measured pace as well. What I'm doing is certainly too fast uh, uh, for our actual hearing. And the third point would be to watch the judge. Um, there may be a way on this technology to pin the window of the judge on your screen so that you can always watch the judge on the screen rather than anyone else. And that's what you do in a normal hearing anyway. So find a way to pin the judge's screen or window in a way that you can see that clearly. Why? Because you have to ensure as an advocate, the judge or arbitrator is engaged, that he's following uh, or she is following your arguments. And if you have doubts about that, you pause and you check in with the judge to find out whether the judge needs clarification. Or if you see Justice Cohen flipping around, looking at his pages and not looking at you, uh, it would be time to stop and say, uh, judge, could I be of uh, any assistance uh, 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 at that point in time? Uh, I would also then talk to you about the fourth point, which is to watch your mannerisms when it's not your turn to submit. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, overlook that because they forget that they're still on the screen. Um, looking angry and frustrated or, or, or uh, bewildered by your learned friend's submission while they're submitting is not a good look. It is distracting to the judge. Um, and I made the point earlier about muting your audio so that your wife or the cat or, the, or, or whatever surrounding sounds, the ice cream truck in the background doesn't uh, uh, become a problem. The last point about advocacy is opening a separate channel of communication. I would open a separate channel of communication with my juniors if I'm using a junior. Uh, I would open a separate channel of communication with my clients if this was a trial, uh, either by WhatsApp uh, or, or any other phone messaging system. I wouldn't necessarily use this platform as, as the channel of communication. I would use a, another a phone-based uh, uh, communication. And if you really need to confer with your clients urgently, which you are entitled to, uh, I would do what I would do in court. I would ask the, the court or the, or the arbitrator for a short uh, 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 recess for me to be able to uh, consult or, or with, my, with my clients. Um, I'm running out of time, but could I perhaps promote a document uh, that the Inns of Court College of Advocacy have very helpfully prepared. It's an extremely um, comprehensive document. Uh, I've put it in the chat box, uh, but if you Google Inns of ICCA and the words principles of remote advocacy, you'd find a really good paper pre prepared comprehensively on many, many practical tips that we may not have covered today. And a lot of what I've said here uh, appear there as well. If I've got just one uh, half a second, uh, half a yes, minute, uh, uh, two aspects of Zoom or any uh, online platform that I feel as an advocate may or may not work. The first is the raise hand function. I mean, uh, we do that for meetings, but judges or, or registrars who are hearing you may not see that little raised hand in the corner right as they're listening to you, or sorry, if they're listening to the other advocate, they would not see the raised hand function. What I feel is more effective is putting your hand up like this, and the judge can clearly see your hand up. Well, my hand needs to be somewhere here, uh, rather than the raised hand function. So that's one function of technology. It doesn't work for, for, for hearings. The other is more controversial. 
Uh, I don't think the shared screen function is something that many judges like. Again, it's up to the judge. Check in with the judge. Uh, when you are watching Chiwi's presentation and he shared the screen and his slides, uh, you had no control of what you could see. Uh, and if you know in a normal physical courtroom, a judge does not like to read just the paragraph that you want to refer to. They would like to read the paragraph before, after, or the page before, after. And they would like to refer to other documents. So uh, many judges don't mind it, but many judges don't like the screen controlled by you when referring documents. Again, check in with the judge whether he, he likes that or, or prefers you to refer to his, uh, refer to your own document and he will refer to his own documents at that time. Again, uh, it's a preference I think may, may, most judges uh, may not like simply because a lot of them will be very new to this, especially in Nigeria. Judges won't uh, like the idea of doing that. Uh, I'm going to stop there and maybe we can take some questions later. Thank you, Over. Thank you very much, um, Brendan. Uh, we are going to have to hire you, as you know, to deal with advocacy training all across Africa. Uh, so, uh, there are a number of points being raised in the chat. I've never seen such a busy chat. Uh, we're going to have to come back to that. We'll save the chat. Um, but obviously, one or two people talking about security and being able to see that a witness isn't being coached. I was in a case where the judge simply asked uh, the witness to hold his, his or her camera up and show the room and that quickly uh, sorted out whether the room was empty or not. That's just a very practical way of dealing with it. Uh, and also um, sent by a, uh, a member of the audience is something called monitor.com, which is, I think, another way of dealing with it. So our next uh, speaker, sadly, um, unexpectedly cannot be with us, but uh, very helpfully, he has prepared a video. Um, and I'm very grateful to him for doing that. And so, uh, we will now um, turn uh, to uh, Mr. Justice Wilson, um, who sits in Australia, and uh, he um, also was an advocate, mainly I think in Melbourne, uh, and uh, took silk in Melbourne, practicing in commercial law and uh, estate law, uh, so he has helpfully done a video for us. So we'll move to his video now. Thank you very much, uh, Brendan. Afternoon, Melbourne time, uh, morning in the UK. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the webinar, Judging and Advocacy in Virtual Court Hearings and International Experience. I'm Josh Wilson. I'm a uh, Justice of the Family Court of Australia. OBA has very kindly uh, invited me to express uh, Australia's response to six questions that he's posed. Um, the first one is the personal experiences of remote hearings as a judge. Overwhelmingly, uh, the way that we've had to adapt has been uh, universally accepted and expectations have been exceeded. Personally, I was quite sceptical at the start, wondering how we'd cope with electronic trials and electronic applications. But um, it's with a lot of uh, with a lot of um, willingness by the profession, it's been done well. Uh, cases have been brought on on short notice. Um, overseas people have been accommodated who wouldn't otherwise have been able to travel here. Uh, the profession has embraced remote hearings and the use of technology. Technical difficulties have emerged, but nothing that's uh, kicked us out of the park, so to speak. Uh, and Strangely enough, because of the availability of court, even in this rather unusual forum, uh, settlements have uh, been achieved. So uh, while there's no substitute to face-to-face -face hearings, um, on the whole, the experience has been very positive. Uh, it's, it's something that my associates and I were talking about recently. It's, it's much harder, of course, for a cross-examiner to catch a liar electronically, but um, still the hearings proceed. The second question involves the IT platform. Over in the federal arena in this country, we use Microsoft Teams for video conferencing and AAPT Global Meet for telephone conferencing. File sharing such as Dropbox for the parties to uh, electronically communicate big volume documents uh, has worked very well, although on one occasion 12 volumes of a court book had to be printed at short notice 
Um, but for those who are technically adept, they don't need to print it, they just follow it on the Dropbox. So all things can be done electronically, and this has actually, if anything, forced people to uh, progress with their move from a Luddite into a technologically savvy uh, court operation. Um, COVID uh, has obviously impacted face-to-face -face hearings, but the hearings have progressed. Um, personally, I, uh, when we were told that there would be no face-to-face -face, uh, trials in the foreseeable future, I conducted a call out of all the cases under my control and um, got people on board who were willing to deal with things electronically, though there was a clutch of people who simply said face-to-face -face hearings were essential that's fine, but they've had to wait until the doors reopen, and at the moment, that's not certain. So um, uh, it has had a bearing, but the bearing's been um, reasonably modest. Uh, it's had also an effect on certain of the orders because, for example, in the family law arena where parents have time with their children, that has been affected by the availability of exchange of the children as between households, but um, most people have been flexible in their approach and that has had a beneficial approach. Question four addresses whether uh, there's a standard type of directions or a special type of directions that has been necessitated. Um, well, the conduct of all hearings has uh, required some uh, finessing. Um, the first and obvious one is whether everyone can hear and see one another or if they're experiencing problems with the contact and with the signal. Um, uh, it's been necessary to ensure that people, the clients turn off their phones and therefore they don't actually participate in the hearings because they've got representation. Where they're unrepresented, obviously, they have to participate and um, they do that by and large respectfully and properly. Um, it's been necessary also in trials to confirm where a person has been unrepresented that there's no one else in the room giving that person notes or instructions on how to answer questions. I had the amusing experience not so long ago that I asked a litigant in person to verify that there was no one else in the room. He said there wasn't. I asked him to hold his computer up and do a 360 spin, which he did. And in the corner right hand side of the screen, another person's elbow was on display. So pretty obvious that he wasn't entirely a witness of truth. Um, at all events, uh, uh, it's been necessary to remind parties that they are not permitted to record what's going on on the screen. Strangely enough, um, that's been abused. Uh, I know of a tribunal in Australia where a person has been filming uh, from the telly screen and then putting that onto YouTube or very naughtily, but anyway, it doesn't extend to how much all this can be completely controlled and policed. Um, public access to hearings and recordings. Well, there are restrictions obviously on who can be present uh, and the court probably all over the world have protocols on uh, who is permitted to participate. Um, litigants are entitled to purchase a copy of the court transcript from a designated uh, a transcript provider, but witnesses and um, people who might have an interest in the particular case cannot. Um, in pre-COVID times, court being open would be visited by the public. Uh, that's obviously changed. But that's not to say that judgments are in any way reduced. The, the publication of them is in the normal way and comes off the conveyor belt, so to speak, with the usual speed. Um, the sixth question asks whether there have been any particular developments in Australian jurisdictions. Well, the first is of interest, uh, not in the family law context, but in the uh, context of juries. Obviously, juries uh, were the first people affected by the pandemic. And uh, in an intermediate trial court in the state of Victoria, where the bulk of the criminal cases are dealt with, um, the court has adjusted to single judge trials without a jury. Now, some people might say that's a bit much, but um, obviously non-murder cases and non-arson uh, cases, but some of the more indictable criminal cases have proceeded without a jury. So that's that's curious. Um, in my court, uh, it's been necessary to deal with the consequences
consequences of people being locked up in their houses and therefore exposed at a greater rate to risk of family violence, this court has reacted by inaugurating a particular list called the COVID-19 list, which means that people who assert that there's family violence being perpetrated traded can apply to any judge around the country, not necessarily in the state in which the litigant finds her or himself for relief. And the protocol requires that case to be heard and determined uh, inside of three days. Generally, it's dealt with on the day or within 24 hours of filing. And the issue is resolved by judicial determination. Um, uh, as well, in uh, my court, there's been the inauguration of a list called the National Arbitration List, which encourages people to arbitrate out of court uh, by the use of accredited arbitrators and thereby overcome the delays that have been occasioned by the prolongations of cases since the closure. Two very useful uh, steps and two very helpful initiatives to ensure that things get moving. Over's seventh question asked for tips from the judge's vantage point. Well. The biggest issue that uh, uh, the Australian courts have found, and I presume to speak for them, is the need to keep going. Even at the very highest of level, the High Court of Australia, which is the equivalent of your Supreme Court of the UK, has conducted its appeals, uh, albeit remotely. So the show goes on, it's just it goes on in a different way. And that requires ongoing close case management. And it also requires a willingness to adapt to the technology from a judge's perspective. A greater amount of patience is called for to deal with the situations that are occasioned by people interrupting and therefore losing the signal, complications associated with getting the witness on screen, um, and the technical issues that arise from all of this. But with a degree of patience, the show will go on. Estimates um, are generally prolonged, so sometimes it's necessary to stop a case uh, that was allocated to go for three days and it goes for five or six to find new dates. Um, but that's something that we just have to adjust to. Another in interesting fallout is um, the reduction in formality that is, is exhibited by the case being heard at home. People sit in there at their desks, in their study or in their lounge room, around the kitchen table, and obviously the formality of court thereby diminishes. So witnesses tend to be a bit more relaxed and they're obviously not on edge, so they can become a little less uh, polite on occasions or they just become a bit more argumentative with cross-examining counsel. Um, litigants themselves are less inclined to resolve cases by discussions because the person on the other side is not uh, down the corridor as one would see in a court hearing. What is the take home point of all of this? We all have to adjust to change. There's no particular end date in sight. We're all doing the best we can. There's been no drop in productivity and there's been uh, hopefully a movement of the cases as the litigants are entitled to expect. Over, it's been a great pleasure to uh, participate in this and thank you all for listening. Bye. I'm, I'm thanking Josh remotely. Uh, I call him Josh, that's Mr. Justice Wilson. Uh, for taking time to do that video. Um, many questions coming up uh, and uh, the um, point about uh, security is one. I know certainly in a case I was recently involved with, you were actually in one room and you didn't enter another room until the person controlling the whole thing let you into another room. So in your other, in your other room, you were perfectly secure, it was completely insulated, no one could hear you then you were moved across when you were ready to another room. It all depends on the platform. But the safe tip is just keep your mic off, keep it muted, if in doubt, mute, uh, because you may never know who is listening. Can we have our next poll? Um, so the uh, next poll, the final poll, we can hold up in a moment. And it really goes to uh, the extent to which remote hearings or virtual hearings uh, can be or will be ex accepted. The question is, does the audience believe that remote hearings will become an important tool for the judiciary and lawyers in the juris jurisdiction in which you practice. Definitely, maybe, unlikely. So let's please have some responses to that. I'll leave it there for a while, and then um, we will come back with the results of that uh, poll. All right. So our final um, speaker, last but not least, is Anna. 
Um, Anna is a silk in South Africa. She is an extremely experienced advocacy trainer. She has devised many skills transfers programs and um, began life as a prosecutor, uh, which is always a good start for uh, skills. So over to you, Anna, from the advocate's point of view. Thanks very much, Ober. Ober has asked me to speak to two things, one about the South African experience in relation to remote hearings, and then also to give some input about ways in which one can adapt one's advocacy for a remote platform. In South Africa, sadly, we have not had the experience that we've heard about from some of the other speakers, and particularly Josh, and I, I call him by his first name, as Oba did from Advocacy Training Days, um, has spoken about the absolute need to keep going and not drop in productivity. South Africa has technological challenges. Our courts are not always adequately resourced. So the experience has ranged widely between different divisions and different courts. The High Court in Gauteng has become a remote hearing default mode jurisdiction. They have run everything throughout our lockdown, which is still ongoing, including trials uh, by remote means. Other High Courts, it is really dependent on the individual judge's view of how matters should be dealt with. And the judge's discretion is very often informed by the extent to which they have been capacitated by the Office of the Chief Justice and actually have the wherewithal personally and within the courts to deal with the remote hearing. We are, however, fortunate that our Supreme Court of Appeal has taken the pandemic to heart and now conducts all of its hearings on a remote platform where the appeals can't be dealt with on paper, and those hearings are working really well. Our Apex Court, however, the Constitutional Court, did not set down anything to be heard for the month of May, is currently on recess, and has not set anything down for until September. And it's not certain even then how those hearings will proceed. I was interested to see one of the questions on the chat about whether there are jurisdictions where one is expected to robe. Now in South Africa, we don't wear wigs anymore, but by and large, the hearings that are conducted remotely, judges do require one to robe fully as if one were appearing in the actual court, the physical courtroom. And I think that that probably assists a great deal with keeping the degree of formality, which is so important given that these are indeed court proceedings. So we've had a somewhat mixed experience, but those who have been prepared to embrace remote hearings have all almost universally said that these are hearings which can and do work efficiently if approached with the right frame of mind. One of the questions that Oba posed to me and asked me to speak on briefly today is whether the skills involved in remote advocacy are different skills or whether really it's the same thing. And there's been interesting divergent views from our speakers, one of whom said the skills need to change. And that's true, I would venture to submit, but only to a degree. Because as Brendan said, generally what makes for good advocacy in an actual courtroom will make for good advocacy in an online platform. So the good news, especially for those of us to whom this is very foreign, is that there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's not a completely different skill set. But as you've heard from virtually all of the speakers, remote hearings are different to in-person hearings really in three important ways. The first is that they are harder to follow for everybody, given the platform. And that also means that there are limited visual cues, there's intense focus on the screen, and that leads to the second difference, which is that they are much more tiring than in-person hearings, and consequently to the third significant difference, which other speakers have also touched on, is that they are usually shorter for both of those first reasons. So, as an advocate, the crucial task is to adapt the skills you already have to cater for those differences. And it comes down to deploying your skills that you've already acquired in the most focused way possible, with the aim of becoming clear, short, and easy to follow, and also placing yourself in the best position to pick up on nonverbal cues so that you can engage appropriately. 
And just hearing those things will make you realize instantly that, again, what makes for good advocacy in that instance um, works online and in a real courtroom. Brendan's already touched on some of the aspects, but I'd like to focus on really three, which I think were the most important ways we can adapt our advocacy to make it most effective in remote hearings. The first is brevity and clarity. Now, those are probably the most important qualities of any advocate in any forum. And I would urge us all to take to heart what I believe is the mantra of the Malaysian Advocacy Training Committee. Certainly something I've heard them say um, in Kuala Lumpur and elsewhere is, be brief, be clear, and be gone. If you are going to achieve that aim, you really need two things. You need, as Chi Wee was explaining, a plan, and then you need much more preparation for virtual hearings in order to distill that plan into a means capable of execution. The focus of your plan must really be twofold. Firstly, deciding which areas you are going to focus on, because it is, as Sir Bernard said, impossible to cover everything at great length. Secondly, to focus then on how you will be delivering what it is you have chosen to make your focus. There needs more than ever in a virtual hearing to be a logical sequence and structure to submissions or questions to make them more effective and easier to follow. Part of your distillation process in working out how you will execute your plan is synthesizing the most crucial aspects you want to say into short sentences, in direct speech, framing short questions for the witnesses, both for chief and for cross, and anticipating the questions you are likely to receive from the bench, and framing mentally or on paper, however you work, short direct answers to those questions. The second aspect that I'd like to focus on is pace. Like Brendan, I'm speaking more quickly now, given that we are conscious about time. But I find that one needs to consciously slow one's pace of delivery for a remote hearing. Because of the lag, it's harder to follow. If you speak at the pace you do even in a normal courtroom, things will get lost. But allied to that is the other deliberate thing you need to do in your delivery, which is to consciously vary your tone, because there is a tendency when one slows down dramatically to adopt a monotone. And that then means that everybody loses focus very quickly. The third point is a tip about being attentive to your judge and your witnesses because you need to be more attentive in a virtual hearing than you'd even do in an in-person hearing, because it is that much more difficult to pick up those non-verbal cues on this kind of platform. Now, one of the ways in which it's really helpful to do that is if you are in a position to use multiple screens. What I find very useful is that whilst you would be looking at your webcam on your device, so that you are speaking directly to the audience, if you can have another screen behind the one on which your webcam is displayed and higher than it, preferably bigger in size so that you have a better view of all the persons displayed on it, it is then much easier to look directly at the camera and see the judge or judges if it's an appellate panel um, and maintain that contact. Pinning the person that you want to focus on is possible both on Zoom and on Teams, and it's a very useful function, particularly when dealing with witness handling, where what you would do is pin the witness who you are leading or cross-examining or who's being led or cross-examined, um, rather than potentially pinning the judge. Oba also raised the question um, and asked me to speak briefly to specific tips for cross-examination, which as you've heard from many of the speakers is really one of the most challenging facets of remote hearings. Because of course the lack of immediacy means you can't have the physical impact on the witness then that you ordinarily would. 
And there is a significant lag in communication with many platforms. So one has a situation very similar to what we in South Africa experience when one is cross-examining through an interpreter. We don't have simultaneous interpretation um, as Sir Bernard has spoken about. We have live interpreters who will interpose between questions and answers. That lag in communication does two very significant things for a cross-examiner. It means that a rapid fire technique, which is often very effective in cross-examination, simply won't work. Uh, it's not possible, and to the extent you try and recreate it, you'll end up speaking over the witness and having to stop yourself and recant. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that the witness has more time to think. So the most in effective way of cross-examining in remote hearings, and in my respectful view, it's always the most effective way to cross-examine, or almost always, is to frame your cross-examination questions as short leading questions, focused short leading questions, which then allows you to deliver them at a more rapid fire pace, and also means that the court will take much more cognizance if there is a delay in an answer, you'll get a much more effective result. You would also need to have at hand and preferably at eye level, whatever ammunition you wish to use to contradict the witness if the response that you get is not what you wanted to, so that you can immediately give a specific reference to the contradicting document, whilst all the time maintaining your view of the witness and looking directly at the witness. There is much more of a tendency to look down in an online hearing, but it's important still for you to keep that connection with the witness as far as possible. And then of course, fundamentally, given the platform, you cross-examine on essentials only. You would need to decide exactly which areas of focus are going to get you the most mileage. You can't run a three-day cross-examination on an online platform. Apart from it not being particularly effective, people are going to get lost. What you say isn't going to be followed and the impact will be lost. Thank you very much, Abba. Uh, thank you very much. Um, excellent points. If I can just pick up on one of the uh, things that's come up on the chat, is justice not at risk if a hearing is shorter and advocacy more limited? Uh, I'd, I'd certainly say the other way around. Justice is at risk if advocacy is too long and hearings are too long in, their, in themselves. Um, the points that you make about being clear, short, and easy to follow are utterly crucial. Uh, and that is really at the heart of advocacy, whether it's a, a remote or virtual hearing or whether it's a live hearing. And uh, these sorts of hearings mean we have to hone our skills to ensure that we are short, uh, precise, and clear. And the advice that I think um, Brendan put out, uh, you'll be familiar with it, Anna, the key principles of remote advocacy, an excellent document produced, I think, in May. There were eight principles that came from that. Uh, liaise in advance. Uh, second, understand the technology. Third, make sure parties can be seen and heard. Fourth, know how to handle the documents. Fifth, make best use of written argument. Sixth, be prepared, be brief and to the point, exactly what you talked about. Seventh, avoid over speaking. And the eighth one, maintain confidentiality. And all of those are developed in detail in those principles. And that's something that Brendan has sent out. Anna, that was very helpful. It, um, I think we can share the results of the um, poll now, uh, which should come up any minute. Uh, here we are. Does the audience believe that the remote hearings will become an important tool for the judiciary and lawyers in the jurisdiction in which you practice? Uh, definitely 72%, uh, maybe 23%, and then 4% unlikely. Um, thank you very much. We can take that down. We have time for a few questions, not many, um, but we will answer the questions separately. Uh, some of the questions that we received in advance, and there were over 30 of them, really went to uh, the issue around um, whether remote advocacy or virtual hearing is something that will be uh, universally accepted. And of course, we know that there is some resistance uh, to this form of hearing, particularly, I would say, in, uh, in some of the African jurisdictions. I know that that is the case in Nigeria. Uh, uh, Anna has told us that it's a mixed situation in South Africa as well, depending on the judge. 
And even in the UK, um, it isn't universally the case that remote hearings are going to become the norm. In fact, I would say it is only an additional tool to ensuring that access to justice is broadened. It is not a substitute uh, for uh, live hearings where you are person in person, and we will always have that, but it is a useful additional tool in uh, that respect. It was Lord Denning, and when you mention Lord Denning's name in any of the African jurisdictions, everybody's eyes light up, who said in a case called Packer and Packer, if we never do anything which has not been done before, nothing will change. The entire world will move on whilst the law remains the same, and that is both bad for the law and bad for the world. And that was in, in the 50s he said that. Um, so, a few questions. Can I um, maybe start with uh, the question that came from the Supreme Court judge? Are we able to put that up because it was such a, uh, a, a complicated question? Can we put that up on screen, that question, and maybe try and um, answer it? Uh, I hope it's available, but it really spoke to um, the issues around uh, appellate advocacy. Whilst that is being brought up, um, another question was around the tendering of documents. How do you overcome hurdles such as tendering of documents during a trial in a remote hearing? Perhaps I can turn to, um, uh, to, to, to Chiwi to, 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 to answer that first of all. Tendering of documents. Isn't it all about loading? I think you're on mute, Chiwi. Yes. Um, assuming then you are the, the, the counsel that's tendering the documents, it's absolutely critical uh, for you to organize it in a PDF format um, and have it downloaded. And the, the next comes uh, a, a decision that you have to make whether or not you want to have control of the shared content or you want to hand it over in Malaysia for online hearings, the, the judge will have a registrar to assist the judge. And consistent with what Brandon said, that it may be better for the registrar then to have master control of that document and where counsel turns uh, uh, in the court proceedings to say to to, to registrar, uh, registrar, uh, Miss X, could you please uh, 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 put up on the screen uh, document uh, A, exhibit A. And of course, all parties should also, apart from having a soft copy, also have a hard copy. Yes. And the difficulty comes where it's a case involving forgery or fraud, where you actually do need to look at, inspect, touch, and feel the original exhibit. And, and that difficulty, I've not thought of an answer for, uh, other than that at some point in time, the proceedings will have to be reserved for that to take place in a physical hearing, insofar as uh, an exhibit that is the very subject matter of forgery or fraud. Thank you very much, Chiwi. As you've said and uh, repeated, it's all about uh, the paginating of documents, making sure that they're in PDF form and loading them in the right way, and then ensuring that somebody controls the documents, probably best to leave it to the, re the registrar or the, the judges the clerk to do that. Thank you. Uh, that deals with that question. The complicated question that came from the Supreme Court judge is now in the chat. Um, it's there. Lord Neuberger once said that the appeal judges were either impressionists or pre-Raphaelites in regard to their approach to preparing for an appeal. Do the panel think that virtual hearings affect that and in, in particular compel the judge to be to prepare, prepare more fully with the potential of forming more definite opinions about the case? If that is a risk, how should advocates prepare? Um, Brendan, is that one you want to take on? Um, I can. Uh, morning, Malcolm. Uh, it's been described as a difficult, complicated question, but uh, advocates know that you take the difficult, complicated question, you distill it down, and you find the most simple, effective answer. Judges, Judge Wallace's question is, if judges have read more of the arguments and prepared more fully, uh, they would uh, invariably form more definite opinions. Uh, but at the same time, in my view, uh, they would also be more familiar with the facts, and more familiar with the law when they come to oral arguments. Uh, and to me, oral arguments are an occasion to persuade in a manner that written work may not have succeeded. Um, so even if judges have read in detail all the written work, oral arguments are where the cases are won or lost, if you are able to persuade the judge as you haven't in written arguments. Uh, speaking for myself, I would welcome a, judges who are prepared more fully, even if they may have formed a more definite view, uh, provided 
uh, and I think we still can persuade them provided you take into account these three uh, helpful uh, points from an advocacy viewpoint. The first point we have made already gets straight to the point. The second one is probably the most important. You have to prepare to argue at the higher end of arguments. Uh, when a judge is prepared more fully and comprehensively, he's not looking for you to start developing the argument from scratch. He's asking you or going to ask you a question at a level uh, which is much higher than what you expected to do if the judge wasn't as well versed with the facts and the law. Uh, and the third part about that is to prepare to effectively be able to answer those questions. Uh, I can guarantee you that when a judge is more prepared, the questions are going to be a lot harder to answer and therefore you have to prepare very effectively to answer those questions. Hope that answers the question. That, that it does, down. it does, Brendan. And, and, and when you look at the chat, a number of the questions have been helpfully answered by uh, what is clearly a knowledgeable audience and we're very grateful to them. Maybe one time for one more question, which I'm going to ask the judges to, to answer. How do you read the room when you're having um, a virtual hearing or remote, a remote hearing? Uh, because of course you, you don't have the same 360 view as you do in a live hearing. So how do you read the room? How do you read reactions? Um, Bernard, what do you what do you think about that? Well, how do you read you how do you read, read the room? Well, you say read the room. I, I think it's much more important for the advocate to read the judge than for the judge to read the room. Um, uh, and, and I think that is a problem. Um, but widening the question, if I may, I do think I'm very much in favour of of uh, remote hearings. But I think certainly at the appellate level, but even at first instance, I think there is a real problem in terms of conducting the hearing, um, particularly when you get to submissions. Um, certainly when I get to submissions, um, I, I'm quite an interactive judge. I will have read the submissions, any final written submissions, I, I've, and, and I would like to press counsel on certain points uh, and that is quite difficult I think to do in a remote hearing. There is a much greater tendency simply because of the technology to let counsel argue the case without interruption whereas certainly when I used to be counsel in the Court of Appeal in England you would often have three judges uh, I'm not sure shouting at you but pressing you for answers. And I think that is quite difficult to do. So when you say read the room, um, I think that is one of the big problems. I, yes, I, yes. Uh, there's less interaction yes. in a remote hearing. And I think that is the one big disadvantage of a remote hearing. Yes, and more difficult to establish a relationship either with the judge or with a witness. Um, but, but, but I think... Um, anyone, can, can I just interrupt yes. you over? For By example, anyone um, who saw the Brexit hearing uh, in the Supreme Court, where you have, I think, nine judges or 11 judges and counsel on their feet, it was like a seminar where the different judges would be shooting questions at counsel um, uh, and, and in asking or needing a, a reply. Now, that in a remote hearing is very, very difficult to do properly. Yes. Because people will over speak and it, there is a little time lag, as, as Anna said. Yes. Uh, and I think that is the real problem in terms of reading the room. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, we are almost at an end. I think just to close, I will just deal with one or two areas. Uh, there have been a number of questions about the constitutional aspect of whether it's a public hearing and that a public hearing that is uh, sufficient to comply with the Constitution, 199 Constitution in Nigeria, Section 36.3 and Section 36.4. Now, I'm not going to ask you about that, um, Bernard. Uh, the question is whether the hearing is public. Well, I think a, a lot of it depends on how you interpret the Constitution in Nigeria. If you, if you interpret it as a purposeful, uh, moving, organic document, then it should be taking into account new ways of working and new ways of hearing matters. If you interpret it as a static document, then of course you may run into problems. Although you can get around it, of course, by uh, making sure that you publicize uh, the link, publicize the identity of the hearing so people can access the hearing from anywhere in the world in, in reality. So that is, I would have said, public. Uh, so that point, I think, remains a debatable point in Nigeria, uh, and we'll see how that ends up. So uh, I would like to end 
uh, this uh, seminar with my grateful thanks to all of the speakers who have been uh, excellent. Um, and you can see there a comment from Edwin Glasgow about the participation of 200. And um, he is right, 200 plus and 600 plus registrants who will get information about this. The speakers have really, really been a credit to this topic uh, and to take their time to, to get up and do this at this time, I'm very grateful to them. Um, they'll have to live in fear that I may come back to them. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but I just want to express my gratitude. And finally, I want to say um, thank you very much to all of the audience, all of you who have joined in Kenya, in South Africa, in Singapore, Malaysia, in Cambodia, uh, in Cameroon, in Nigeria, uh, in Europe, in the UK, uh, uh, Malaysia. We have um, really, really enjoyed the contributions and we're wishing you all um, uh, very best of luck in your future. There have been a number of students on this seminar. We uh, love the fact that students are on this seminar uh, because they've got their whole careers ahead of them and plenty of times to make the same kind of mistakes that we've made. So um, thank you to everybody um, and uh, wishing you a happy day. Thank you to the team behind who have helped us to put this on. Uh, they know who they are and uh, we are ever grateful to them. Bye-bye.